the matter. I don't guarantee to make any of you happier at the end of the talk, but perhaps I can confuse you a little bit. Um, the, my talk is gross national happiness, as uh, you know, Dr. Braid said yesterday. The, that gross national happiness, it's a debate that is picking up internationally. And uh, it is, but what I would say that uh, this debate really is an exchange of perceptions, people's perceptions on happiness. We know that uh, you know, intellectual giants have been talking about happiness over the centuries, and, and nobody, we still don't have a common understanding of happiness. You ask, you ask talk to 10 people and you get 15 different uh, interpretations. So I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to talk largely on the, uh, in Bhutan's context, what gross national happiness is, and obviously this kind of, this topic which is very profound uh, uh, for me, to, to try and sum it up in uh, 30 minutes, I'm going to just uh, try and explain what GNH, happiness, gross national happiness means to us in Bhutan. Okay. I want to be very careful that we, uh, I don't want to give the impression we are happier than we actually are. Bhutan is a developing country with the uh, challenges which all of, uh, faced by all developing countries. We're dealing with youth education, unemployment, uh, social problems, including suicides now, rural urban migration, and, uh, and then, of course, globalization, which is like an aerial and digital invasion uh, these days. So I'll talk more about uh, the background. The term gross national happiness was first uh, announced in uh, 1979 when the king of Bhutan, the fourth king of Bhutan, was interviewed in India by some Indian journalists. They said that, look, we are the closest neighbor and we know nothing about Bhutan. For example, what's your gross national product? You might all uh, remember that before GDP, it used to be GNP, gross national product. So the king said, no, uh, actually gross national happiness is more important to us than gross national product. Okay, so that, these words really now have become historic and uh, I'm, I'll tr I'm gonna try and explain that. Uh, we really have to look at the, uh, you know, the geo, this is Bhutan situation, but I think it's relevant to most countries. We look at now the geopolitical situation. We are half a little more than half a million people between India and China. Okay, 1.4 billion, 1.3 billion people. So this is, ours is a small a society with a very strong sense of vulnerability, what uh, I would call the threat Threat perception of a small state, small country. So what Bhutan did because of this, by policy, we decided to survive by hiding in the mountains. So that's why very little is known about uh, Bhutan. And that's why we have this image, very mystical image, the last Shangri-La, the hidden kingdom. And, and well, it kind of works for us because uh, tourists are now willing to pay $250 to see this mystical kingdom. Um, in the, you know, with, uh, with time in the 1960s, Bhutan opened up to so-called, the so-called development process. Okay. We were one of the last countries. By then, the world had gone through about four decades of this so-called uh, of, of development. And we, with the advantage of hindsight, we saw that the world interpreted development purely as economic development, material development. It is a kind of this pursuit of uh, material wealth. And uh, that's when we, were, we looked around, we thought there were, there were countries that had become rich, but not, societies were not necessarily happy. You know? so, so that, and then uh, Bhutan was able to say, look around and say, okay, that you know, human development needs a higher goal, and therefore it should be uh, happiness, you know? not just economic development. And it was also helped by you know, societies that had a uh, you know, number of scholars, people are coming from countries like Japan and all now to look at, uh, to see what this is all about, that uh, countries that have achieved GDP but find something missing. Um, so gross national happiness in that sense is a pun on gross national product. 
the whole message is that we have to go beyond GDP, GNP. You know, GDP, GNP are broken promises by now. Um, the, so we were able to, in that sense, uh, you know, use, turn this late start into an advantage. And uh, I'd like to quickly then talk about gross national happiness. I, you know, I cringe to think of uh, when I hear people saying that, oh, you know, this uh, happy country, happy people, uh, tell us how, please make us happy, tell us about happiness. But uh, in this context today, I'll, I'll be a little prov provocative and talk about, and uh, talk on the premise that yes, we do have a level of gross national happiness. So what is gross national happiness? Um, it's, not, it's not a kind of a sudden enlightenment, you know, but it's really the expression of values of the past that we, because we remained in self-imposed isolation, we were able to preserve you know, a mixture of good leadership and good fortune, that we had these uh, values when many countries around us had lost them. So I want to describe uh, this gross national happiness uh, in four different stages, and this is my own personal uh, interpretation and understanding. The first is what I call the intuitive happiness, and this is something which I think m all of us, all Asian countries and others, of course, would be familiar with, you know, the rural societies, communities of the past that lived in interdependence. Uh, communities like we are a rural village with uh, the rural healer, carpenter, uh, singer, you know, uh, dancer, monk, preacher. So community, a community where people helped each other. The, uh, the perhaps the difference in Bhutan is that uh, this interdependence goes beyond the human community to the all life forms, the environment, the natural environment, wildlife trees, plants, that uh, the intuitive uh, uh, understanding that we are more dependent on nature than nature is on us. Yeah. So that the, the respect for life forms. So, but that we also know with so-called development is changing. Then uh, another, the next stage would be that once Bhutan, once we start talking about gross national happiness, we are fortunately being challenged you know, the development workers, international organizations, including all the UN agencies saying, okay, so if you talk about happiness, what is that, GNH? What is, if it's going to be a goal for development, how do you measure it, you know, and how do you explain it? So we were, in that sense, forced to do a little more thinking, some academic construction around this uh, concept. So in short, how I understand it is that, that happiness we know you know, partly a spiritual influence that lies within the self. Uh, there's no external source of happiness. The uh, faster car, bigger house, uh, nicer clothes, etc., does not give you that uh, that happiness. And this, this, we explain it. The king of Bhutan, when he first mentioned it, explained happiness as contentment. Just a long-term, abiding sense of contentment. Contentment with what you have. Not the Disneyland happiness, not dream world, not, uh, not even singing and dancing to an extent, you know, but that uh, uh, permanent sense of contentment. So then, the, uh, which means that we accept this, uh, this is a contentment which lies within the self. So then we move to the next stage where then it became the responsibility of the state, of the government to create the conditions, that's what he's saying. Uh, governments, we know, do not make people happy necessarily. They're some very often better at making people unhappy. But uh, the, so this became, this a sense, a responsibility of the state, we say, to create the conditions where citizens can pursue happiness. It's not a guarantee of happiness by the government. It's not a promise of happiness, but it's a responsibility. So that's where the government of Bhutan, to create those conditions, define the four pillars of happiness. That is, that's uh, you know, uh, sustainable, equitable economic development. Because it's not, uh, it doesn't, uh, you know, it's not against economic development, but 
we say that uh, it needs to be more holistic. So it's uh, equitable economic development, uh, preservation of the environment, preservation of culture, and good governance. So these are the four pillars which were expanded into nine domains. I'll not go into all the details. And the nine domains further into indicators where we do this, uh, where we do the survey, GNH survey as it's uh, becoming uh, popularly known. So that's why we say that in this case, uh, happiness is a serious business. Happiness is no laughing matter as, uh, as someone said. Um, you know, the, uh, we, what we find, that this is the difference, was in many countries, about 40 countries have now claimed that they've adopted cross-national happiness. But I think most of these are from, uh, with NGOs, you know, uh, civil society, people doing very good work, but looking for, uh, you know, something to hang on to. And, uh, and something, they, this, the term GNH, the concept seems to give these organizations some comfort. But I think many, in many countries, they're still on the fringes. In Bhutan, the difference is it's a responsibility, you know, it's a mandate given to the government. Then um, the next stage, internationalization of cross-national happiness. And this is the, uh, this is the international discourse that has uh, picked up. I would be, I would hasten to add that it's not, uh, it's not, Bhutan is not in a position to go out and teach happiness or preach GNH, but, you know, take part in this discourse. And, you know, the, yesterday also someone talked about the SDGs. I mean, we are all signatories to the SDGs. The, after the MDGs uh, of the UN 2015, when the world was kind of discussing what next, you know, Bhutan was also asked to do a, uh, uh, a kind of a development alternative paradigm. I was involved in uh, the discussions. And looking around, what I saw was that when we talk about these four pillars, the world has actually done more work uh, on these four pillars, on at least three pillars, like environment, because of global warming and uh, you know there's climate change and all that. There's so much uh, scientific work done, which we could pick up, which say a country like Bhutan is not capable of. The um, good governance, with, especially with ICT now, you know, smart cities, smart countries, smart governance, interactive governance, and all that. So there's a lot we could learn, again, from the outside. Of course, uh, in terms of the sustainable uh, economic development, you know, what's closest to the conventional interpretation of uh, development, the, uh, again, we could pick up, like, uh, like infrastructure, inf moving on to the information age and all there's much we could learn. What is interesting, I think, is that uh, culture s seems to be neglected. S it seems to be completely overlooked. There's not much emphasis on culture at all. And I thought uh, that, was a, that was a pity. And that in, in this, in this uh, kind of global discourse, that this is something that we could, GNH could emphasize. We actually did take it to the uh, UN, but uh, culture, the SDGs, the 17 SDGs, which someone mentioned yesterday, actually neglects culture again. And that uh, may be one of the challenges. And that's why in, when we talk about the SDGs, we are talking about putting SDGs into the concept, in the context of cross-national happiness, so that we have these uh, priorities. In the, what have we actually done? So to try and uh, make it, uh, to connect it with media, communications. I didn't go into detail in some of this because I think the next session is going to come with, uh, is going to go a little more in depth into Asian religion and philosophies and communications. But what we did try in, uh, in Bhutan was also to get the media community, because the media were actually quite skeptical, saying, okay, again, GNH, we want us to, you know, we're, we have journalism to work on rather than just write about environment and culture, et cetera. But, uh, but the approach, our approach really was, is not what media should, writes about happiness, but what is the responsibility of media, of journalists, of professionals in a society that claims to be a GNH society? So what should the priorities be? What should the, what are the values? If, uh, if uh, you know, identity, 
is the shared consciousness of the people in different parts of a country, which is really established by media. The, uh, picking up on this uh, imagined communities, imagined community by Anderson, Benedict Anderson, and the whole idea of the media, uh, you know, creating the shared consciousness and shared values. When people listen to the same, uh, you know, radio programs, watch the same TV programs, read the same newspapers, and pick up values. And at a time when a lot of, even in Bhutan, a lot of the young people, the sense of uh, hu humor, you know, clothing style, etc., is picked up from Bollywood and Hollywood. So, uh, so how do you, uh, within the country, how do you define and create those values and, uh, and well, so instill? Because in, a, in developing countries, I think we all know the media have an important role of uh, education, uh, sometimes, well, force, even forcing people to think. So we say that media must be part of this uh, experiment and uh, story, some of the some of the points. I, mean, I just noted a few bullet points. You know that uh, many journalists write stories for themselves rather than the society or for the people, for the audience. Um, and this is something I was saying that we would uh, go into a little more in depth later. Uh, media being sensitive to the society of the society they're working in. Um, when global media is contributing to so much unhappiness, consumerism, uh, commercial, uh, commercialization, sensationalism now, then with uh, social media, hate speech, etc., can we treat uh, the audience as people rather than consumers? It's not a new concept. I think it's been, it's been around for some time. Um, and just as media needs to hold uh, government accountable, media must be accountable to the people you know, to the readers, viewers, listeners. And uh, just as also state, in we, what we say, in a small country, the state must invest in media. Media should also emphasize invest in professionalism, trainings, etc., rather than just uh, people. We even went to the stage where we're trying, in terms of advertising, it's uh, unusually uh, in Bhutan, the largest advertiser is the government. So I was involved in a ad government advertising guideline, you know, saying that, okay, we will, without being, without trying to pressuring media, let's, we will give adver advertisements to media that are conscious of values. And it was actually easier to define uh, what is not GNH media than to define GNH media. So we're saying, okay, so media that don't advertise uh, alcohol, tobacco, even junk food, let's go to that extent, you know, and who media that talk about education, health, will advertise there. So that was uh, one strategy. It hasn't entirely worked, but that was the approach. Can media help people make good decisions? So the basic message of my uh, brief statement really is that in this rethinking communication in the research in Asia, that uh, when you talk about the values, we have looked everywhere. We've looked particularly or largely at the West, but have we looked uh, back? Have we looked at back at our own societies, at our own histories, at the values that have existed? You know, now the world is talking about sustainability, but we've actually been talk, uh, talking about sustainability for more than 100 years in, uh, in every sense. So I thought that I would keep my address to this uh, brief introduction and be, be very happy to uh, take questions if there are any. We have a, shall we do that? Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So the questions come later. I will not, uh, I will uh, not go into detail. I'll be very happy to discuss with anyone who's interested in this, but I thought this brief introduction is what I would like to do this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
Dasho Kenli Dorji on sharing the experience of Bhutan on the source, the core, and the means of sustaining happiness. At this point, we will move on to the plenary session two on UNESCO Emeritus Dialogue, Asian Philosophies, Religions, and Communication, which will be moderated by Dr. Binod Agrawal. Dr. Binod Agrawal is one of India's pioneers in holistic study and qualitative research and quantitative survey in development and communication. He has carried out formative process and impact studies in information technology and television for two decades. His interests span anthropology, architecture, design and planning, development, satellite communication, and education. Until recently, Dr. Agrawal was professor of eminence and director of Talim Research Foundation, Ahmedabad, from 2008 to 2015, which he founded as director when, uh, during the period of 1995 to 2008. He was founder, vice chancellor of Himgiri Z University, Dehradun, from 2005 to 2012, and founder director of Mudra Institute of Communications, Ahmedabad, from 1993 to 1994. Friends, let us welcome to the stage Dr. Binod Agrawal. <laughs> Thank you so much for introduction. Uh, I have been very modestly working in the field of communication and development uh, all my life. So I will focus my attention on this topic because it's uh, dear to me and four eminent persons are with me today to discuss UNESCO discussion for today and the four plenary speakers are Professor Father, Professor Dr. Father Friend Joseph Elias. May I request him to come on the stage please? Dr. Soo Kyung Han from Korea. And Dr. Le Leona Q. Israel from Thailand. Or, I'm sorry, Philippines. From the same institution we are sitting and enjoying our hospitality. Four eminent speakers come from different continents and have a wide experience working in the field. Therefore, it is I'm, I feel very fortunate to have them together here this after uh, this morning. I will briefly introduce each of them. So at the end, we don't have to talk much about them. Uh, Father Elias is known to me through a very different route. More than 10 years ago, we met. And at that time, he made a very brief comment, which is stuck to my mind. He said, uh, Emic has been here for almost 30 years, but never, according to him, discussion, religion, and media has taken place. And he wondered why it is so. So I said, don't worry. I will try to introduce this here. So we had a, a session on media and religion when we met in Singapore some years ago. After that, there is a continuous process going on that we are now talking about media and religion. I will leave it to him to tell us 
why that happened. But that's a uh, one dimension of communication media that has not been discussed much in the past. Uh, Father Elias has been director of the uh, Asian Research Center located in John's, uh, St. John's University in Bangkok. And all his life, he has been serving the church in one form or the other, and a pioneer in the area of social communication. He was awarded for that. And he right now is stationed in Amdaba in Manila, helping the church and the university, uh, Santo Thomas, to teach social communication. Uh, I will request him to speak first. Second person that we have here today is Dr. Imtiaz Yusuf, who is assistant professor and lecturer director for Buddhist Muslim Understanding College of Religion, Religious as Methiol University in Thailand. He is a multilingual. He knows many languages and has been working in variety of area. At the moment, he is teaching also in Gen Georgetown University, Washington, D.C., USA. He spe specializes in religion with a focus on Islam in Thailand and Southeast Asia and in Muslim-Buddhist dialogue, uh, which is very important in the case of Thailand. Uh, Dr. Yusuf regularly writes on Islam, religion, and Middle East for the Thailand-based Bangkok Post and Nation. The third speaker we have is Dr. Su Kyung Han, very interesting. She has spent part of her life in Germany, did her PhD degree from Germany in media studies and communication, and returned back to Korea, where she is a teaching at the moment in Ision National University as a lecturer. And also, she's a freelance writer, uh, contributing a great deal of writing in both German and Korean. So I had some uh, difficulty initially to talk to her in English, but she knows as much as English as I know, so there's no problem. Her first book appeared in 2005 that was in German, Korean woman writing for German uh, in German language, Theory and Contradiction of Media Globalization that appeared in 19, uh, in the, uh, 2015, and earlier that appeared globalization, regionalization of media in Asia in 2010. Uh, at the moment, she stays in Seoul, and she has been contributing a great deal from there. The fourth speaker is from nowhere but Manila, uh, Dr. Leona Israel. Uh, Dr. Israel is a faculty member of the Department of International Studies of Miriam College. She was program fellow of the Asia Pacific Development Center in Kuala Lumpur. She was also facilitator at the Institute of Women's Studies and consultant on gender and BBM at the National Anti-Poverty Commission. She is also a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Humanities and Cultural Studies. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a galaxy of distinguished speakers today, and I'll request to start with Father Elias, please. I would request take about 10, 15 minutes, so we'll have enough time to answer questions if there is one. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, me not for your introduction. Uh, he mentioned already that religion was never in Amic in the past, and he was the one to try to bring religion into Amic, and he did not succeed till today. Today, finally, for the first time, we have an Amic meeting, also religion is a subject, and we all know religions, all major religions come from Asia. So we have a special reason to bring that into our lives and our studies. So that's why I thought I'd give you some basic points, only very essential, 
without going too much into detail. So I would first say the word religion has Latin origin. So it is religion, religare. Ligare means to connect. So to join, which here means linking the human and divine. Thus, religion can be considered as a system of reconnections with something beyond. Or what Rudolf Otto, famous scholar, said, used to name the numinosum. The numinosum, that means beyond and something holy, which seems to be true for Asia. All major religions originated from here, from Asia, including Christianity, and they are part of every culture. So reconnect means then that to communicate, any reconnection is actually based and maintained through communication. And the backdrop of this communication is culture. So the way religion is lived and expressed itself is determined by the way it takes place within different cultures as the way of living people. The concept and experience of religare, reconnect, is an essential part of being the be of people, of being every culture, is reflected in prophets, in gurus, in masters, in enlightened persons, bringing the numinosum of Otto to the center of life and action of any group of humans. Buddha, the enlightened one, reconnects religare towards the nirvana. Muhammad is reconnecting through the book as a means of communication, Quran. The Indian goddesses reconnect to different ways of life, and also Christianity reconnects through and to the person of Jesus Christ. But then the different means of communication, quotation mark, used in all these religions are beside the persons involved, expressed in sayings and writings, in preaching, in signs and symbols, in pictures and architecture, especially through rituals, which are in themselves, again, a special way and means to share and communicate a broad field of studies and research. In the past, all different means of communication were, quotation mark, used in this process, from writing to printing, from broadcasting in sound and image, and similar ways, with the newest developments in technology. However, all these ways and many of life activities now are related to the categories of analog and digital. Not only digital, analog still is needed and exists. While in analog, one thing follows the other, digital communication is broken down into one and zero, with many more ways and possibilities than the previous analog system. In the new developments, distances are removed or strongly minimized. Time is always and everywhere. There's no limits anymore in room and space. Opening also for religions and religious practices, new ways of communicating to be religare, to be reconnected in religious convictions and practices. So basic ways and religious practices are not necessarily changed, but are given new possibilities in reaching out, changing ways of communicating, but maybe also bringing new dimensions to the fore which did not exist this way before and only in a limited way also for religions. But also additional questions arise. Does digitalization make religious sharing broader, more quick, and quotation mark efficient without losing a full exchange and a reconnection on different levels of human reception and religious experience also in the life of society and their cultures? Question. What do such new conditions and possibilities mean, especially for young people is somehow born and growing up with a tablet already and gadgets 
which might not necessarily promote interaction in the reality of life. There are plenty of friends in social media, but no real friends to talk to necessarily at home and in the old family. How to establish religions but also other really gated groups act, react, connect with in such a world. What is the role of these new digital possibilities in and for religious practices in the lives of individuals and communities? Are there new ways of connecting with each other, but also to really gather with God and within themselves? So these are all questions for all religions and especially also in our Asian situation. So for an Asian approach, for proper academic research in religion in Asia, the Japanese scholar Satoshi Ishii has proposed the Tried World Communication Studies from a Buddhist perspective, where he defines the paradigm as, quotation now, a comprehensive unit of assumptions, hypotheses, and methods that guide theory, construction, and research directions. And he proposes from an American to move from an American-centered methods to our Asian realities, also for communication and religion. So he notes that in the American approach, the culture is rarely explicitly taken into consideration in the research conceptualization because culture is usually not regarded in this American approach as a variable, which is quite different in Asia. For the role and relation, relation of religion and communication in Asia, he distinguishes between two models of worldview, which also determine respective communicative approaches and models in and for Asian cultures. There is the monotheistic and the polytheistic culture, uh, worldview, which determines the flow of communication in these directions. In the monotheistic view, there are the three elements of God, humans, and natural beings. They are somehow resting in themselves, but related. This is the perspective of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Here, communication takes place between and in this, on these three levels. In the polytheistic world view, the boundaries between God and goddesses, deities are not separated, but interrelated with each other. So Ishii contributes this approach to ancient Greek Roman religions, but as well as to Buddhism, Hinduism, and Taoism. We should have the picture there. He sees this triangular arrangement of the three worlds as not hierarchical, but dynamic and changeable according to contextual changes. The sovereignty of each world is not decisively predetermined, but is tentative and interchangeable. From here, he, he develops his tri-world communication studies from Buddhist perspective. From this, he proposes for Asia. First, communication scholars should shift their conventional analytic, mechanic, mechanistic, and individual centers views of communication to holistic, systematic, and correlationship centered views. And then second, that in this quotation from him again, in depth discussion of existential philosophy should play a crucial role in future communication studies, which also includes the role of religions. He actually proposes, quotation from him again, to explore the possibility of developing a new alternative paradigm of communication studies from a cross-religious comparison of monotheistic and polytheistic worldviews. Following issues approach, Yoshitaka Maike, proposed recently in an editorially published just last year for an Indian uh, university, four content dimensions of Asia-centric paradigm. First, the linguistic, second, the religious philosophical, three, the historical, and fourth, the aesthetic dimensions. All cultures, he says, use language as common code of communication, 
and a symbolic vehicle of indigenous epistemologies. Cultural values and communication ethics have been largely shaped by religious philosophical underpinnings. No culture exists without its own history, from which its members learn important lessons about relational communication and environmental communication and spiritual communication. Every culture performs communication in rituals and ceremonies, and that gives a sense of binding and belonging to its members and appeals to their ethos and aesthetics. From this he calls to the to revalorize beside others also Asian religious philosophy teaching and behavioral principles. So this is just one way of perspective. And to conclude with another, there is a famous well-known book by Jogot Wang on collection on de-westernizing communication, just to give an example there. It presents several contributions and the one of our awardee from yesterday, Shelton Gonaratwe, is very much appreciated there. He proposes a new structure in communication studies on the basis of quotation, triumvirate, philosophy, theology, and science. Together with others, he promotes especially a Buddhist foundation for communication, which he also proposes in one of his latest publications on the mindful journalism. He refers in a similar way in these one collections in this book to Asian values as quotation, reflecting the core principles of Buddhism, Hinduism, Confucianism, which do not support authoritative governance or a subservient system of communication outlets. Vima Dissanayake lists two of, his, in a, two of his five contexts and challenges for communication research in Asia. Uh, the Asia of Asia theory, communication theories, which are especially related to religion, the rituals, the ceremonies and performances, and the role of language in different Asian religions and traditions which are realized in Buddhist approach. The Islamic perspective in this book of Wang is reflected also by a contribution from Iran. And herself, titles her contribution in the book, a concluding in the book, of the Jewish Christian biblical reference to the fall of the Tower of Babel from the book of Genesis for the historical, linguistic, and humanist, humanist role of understanding. She refers to the roots, quotation from her, roots traced back to theology and philosophy an interpretation of ancient religions and classical lit literacy text as a primary concerns and hermeneutic analysis. So these are just some points which could lead and direct us into uh, further studies on religion and social communication in Asia. And for this, we have an Asian Research Center of Religion and Social Communication, which was mentioned by Professor Binot already before in St. John's University in Bangkok where we have a periodical, Religion and Social Communication, a book series published by USD Publishing House, and also thematic roundtables every year on these this subjects. The next year's roundtable, the title will be Religious Communication in Multicultural Asia, Realities, Experiences, Challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. Now I will request Dr. Tyler to speak. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers and especially to Father Eilers for inviting me here. I met him about 10 years ago uh, when he did a conference on social communication at Assumption University, where I was teaching before. Uh, before I go to my presentation, I need to introduce myself, because I have a very varied, back, very different background. I was born in Africa, in Tanzania. And when I say that to my students, they ask me, why are you not black? And yes, I said, there are people like me there. Uh, being born in Tanzania of an Indian origin, uh, I hold a British passport. Uh, 
I'm living in Thailand for 27 years. I speak six languages. I speak English. I speak Swahili. That's the African language. Many people don't know that. I speak Hindi and Urdu. I studied that when I went to study in India. I speak Arabic because I work on Islam and I speak Thai. Uh, so I learned Hindi when I went to India. So I speak six languages. So for people of communication here, I tell them, yesterday somebody told me, oh, you, you are a real global person. I said, no, I don't say that. I say, I was globalized before globalization. My globalization is not the Pepsi-Cola globalization. It's the globalization of languages, cultures, and religions. I've, ta I've worked in Thailand for 27 years. I've worked in Assumption University for 12 years. I'm teaching now in Mahidol University, where I've been for also a long time. And I say that I'm a Muslim among Buddhists, and I'm a, I'm a Buddhist among Muslims. I'm a Muslim among Catholics, and I'm a Catholic among Muslims. Because that's how I'm a Muslim among Catholics, and I'm a Catholic among Muslims. Because that's how I see the world. I don't understand the word globalization at all. It emerged in 1990, and still I have a struggle with this word. Because I can't eat the same kind of food for more than two days. <laughs> uh, and my world is different. Sometimes I'm in Africa, sometimes in India. I did my PhD in USA. I'm in America. I'm in Southeast Asia. So I really don't know who I am. Maybe God destined me to be born at this time. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's, that's an asset for my young students. I'm teaching about 400 students in my College of Religious Studies, and all of them are Buddhist. I'm the only Muslim teacher in that. So, and when I see the world, I work on, comp I'm not a media person, I'm from religious studies. When I see the world, I see what is going on is the wars of religious nationalism. Nationalism has turned religious in this age. And in my view, the next stage is religious fascism. Be ready for it. The world looks very violent to me. It is not the global age which I was born in, where we used to live together. When I go to Africa, they, call, they, they tell me, you are my brother. But I used to live in southern Thailand, and one day they told me, my colleague told me, uh, Achan Yusuf or Sir Yusuf, you are Muslim, is good. Where you are Malay, I love you more. Now, Muslims can understand what I mean. <laughs> I said, where is the Muslim brotherhood? <laughs> I see a cosmic war going on. I see that all religions, there's no religion today which is not free from the stain of violence. And this stain of violence doesn't come with religions, it comes with the people who are following religions. Multiculturalism is failing. Yet we have all this open access to information and communication while we are here. But we are seeing polit political, ethnic and ethno-religious conflicts. These conflicts are resulting of non-religious factors. So I believe that the social science theory that religion is the cause of all conflict is a fallacy. It's wrong. It's historically wrong, it's religiously wrong, because if, it, if that was the case, then all the founders of religions would have been fighting and warring all the time, which they did not do. What we see today in Asia is that, or all around the world, our life is Googled. Professor Google knows more than me is more smarter than me. Our life is Android. We live a disrupted life. Yesterday, somebody was talking about that. 24 hours Google life. Google knows where I'm going, what is my flight time. But when I go to China, I have more peace because there's no Google. The Americans say, oh, there's no freedom in China. There's human, no human rights, no freedom of expression. This word, I read that in American journals on, on communication. So I asked the Chinese, why there's no Google, why there's no all this Android, uh, smart, uh, Google or Yahoo. Why is all this restriction? They told me, these are people on very high uh, stages, they told me, we want to preserve our culture. This is the challenge for Asia, especially. I, I'm very, I, I see India very dearly, because I spent 12 years as a student over there, and everything is fading away. In Thailand, everybody is on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the phones. This is a challenge. Uh, we don't eat without taking a picture. We don't say grace anymore. <laughs> uh, so we, I think we Asians and Africans, we are modern by accident. Accident of colonialism. That's true. And this accident is taking place through these gadgets of communication we have. Religions are basically the source of peace, but to remove suffering, but today they have become sources of all war. Religion is back, but back with a vengeance. Secular, 
there was a hope by Lenin that capitalism would, would be the last stage of imperialism. The, and the history has not ended. So that's where we are today. And we find in Asia, democracy, liberalism and secularism are not related, but capitalism is. So everybody has gadgets and communicating. But at the same time, we in ASEAN, for the ASEAN people here, ASEAN economic community is a priority over ASEAN socio-cultural community. This is a challenge again for the media. The media is so much in sens sensationalization. And all the conflicts, you know, Rohingya conflict going on, <laughs> I knew it about 30 years ago. I met the leaders of Rohingya and they told me, thanks to social media, everybody knows about us. We don't need to meet billion, we don't need to spend millions of dollars for the world to know. People are doing it. Putting on fake pictures, fake news about the clash between Islam and Buddhism. And this is all because of media. Everybody, pictures from Africa are, 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 are there's, there's, a, there's a photo which is viral about Rohingya circulating among the Muslims of showing of burned bodies. But that is from a tanker which was burnt. And the village was burned because of the tanker exploded. And it is being shown that how Buddhists are persecuting and murdering Muslims. Totally false. So this is what we are facing today. The challenge of how to stop ethnocide and genocide. And there comes the media. Fundamentalism is growing and religions are fading away fast. You know, the, dif the distinction, uh, Professor Ayla just talked about communication. The distinction between human and the animal is language. And communication is based in language. Animals do not have religion because they do not have a capacity of language. I'm talking about Max Muller here. Animals just function to condition. If I tell my dog in Thailand, kin cow, he understands, eat rice. But when I go to my home in Africa and I say to my dog, kin cow, he doesn't understand anything. But I say, kula chakula, ah, he knows it's time to eat the meal. So language is the barrier between human and animals. And we have to know only human beings have, ra have languages. Because all the founders of religion, Jesus, Muhammad, the Rishis, who gave us the Vedas, the Quran, all are communication in language. This is reality. And that's the, that's the gap between human and animal. But social science theories goes by social Darwinism and all that. So the religion's communication about compassion, about mercy, about charity, about agape, is all lost. Even when you look at the, at the religious traditions, Moses talks about when he, he wants to talk with Pharaoh, he says he needs to communicate with Pharaoh in the right way. When the rishis have their meditation in the Himalaya, it's always the sound from inside, Om Hari Om, Om Namah Shivaya. This you can't say outside, it comes from internal. Same with the Buddha, same with the Quran. And all of them, after having this communication, what did they do? They did their early social media action, uh, ac activity of telling their followers, go and say it to the world. And that's our responsibility of all the communication students here who are studying communication. I'm very much concerned about the young generation because I believe that I received a peaceful world from my parents, but I'm bequeathing a violent world to the future generation. I'm very much concerned about my children and the young people here because the life is all Google and life is all disrupted. Furthermore, uh, so our, uh, students in, in, in communication and people in communication and media should, I, I think you're very well, you very well know about the saying by William Hurst when he said, you furnish the pictures and I'll furnish the war. This is what is going on today. That's what communication is doing. So really we have terrorism in name of religion, but religions are not terrorists. That's how they're used for, they're exploited. And I tell my students that communication, they're so much dependent on, inter on internet. And I said to the students here, internet is not knowledge. It's KFC delivery. It just delivers to you. What is knowledge? Knowledge is in the questions you ask. Professor Lend is here. Due respect to Professor, done great work on, on communication and cultures. Multiculturalism is a failure. Everybody knows that. So even on the ecological front, terrible world we have, com we have, we have done. And I don't believe that you know, the doomsday, God is going to bring doomsday. I, I, as a Muslim, I should believe that. But I think we are going to destroy ourselves with the world because of the destruction of the ecology. 
doomsday will happen by us and not by something outside. So the main questions for the communication people is, what role can you play in building a multicultural world? What kind of the world are we passing on to the next generation? People in communication or in media, or they, they don't pay attention to this. So uh, these are my main arguments that Mishia has to talk about. There's a, there's a view that the, there's a book called World Without Islam. They think the world would be happier. <laughs> we had uh, Professor Dorji talk about gro gro gross national happiness. Uh, there's a, a scholar, Graham Fuller, World Without Islam, and he says it would be no much better than we have today. And it, would be, it is a challenge before us. I'm going to show some slides. Uh, before I do that, let me conclude by saying that we are modern by accident. We don't have understanding of what is modernity and technology. And we need to understand diversity and democracy, especially in Asia, because Asia has its own cultural sources of living together, and they are being eroded constantly. Before I finish, I want to, show, I want to share some of, uh, uh, some of the slides I have prepared. So this is the map of Asia. Here, India and China are the two main cultural influences, religious influences. The whole Southeast Asia is about India and China because we got languages from there, we got religions from there, we got cultures from there. Uh, I need to do this here. Southeast Asia has 42% Muslim and 40% Buddhist. But let me tell you one thing. I work on Islam and Buddhism, but the, in the 900 years of coexistence between Islam and Buddhism, there's no one Muslim scholar of Buddhism and no one Buddhist scholar of Islam. This is where Southeast Asia is. This is a 400-year mosque in southern Thailand. It doesn't look like mosque. It is syncretism. It's an early communication through architecture. The roof is Thai, the balcony is Chinese, and the below is a Malay house. The Malay house is the mosque. This is how cultures used to exist together before. This is another mosque in, in Indonesia. My friends here know it has no minarets. This is a Chinese mosque in Indonesia, again. You can't make it up. You may think it's a Chinese temple. This is very interesting in Kudus in Indonesia. There is a mosque, there's a Hindu temple, and there's a Buddhist temple behind that. All this is going away. Indonesia is not more moderate anymore. My friends tell me we are moderate. We are Muhammadiyah and we have NU. I said, it doesn't work anymore. FBI is more stronger, you know what I mean. <laughs> so, no religious system. This is Kushwan Singh for, I love Kushwan Singh. <laughs> he says, no religious system is known to have escaped the cancer of intolerance. No religious system is free from the cancer of intolerance. The, um, there's a conflict going on in southern Thailand. It is about the Malay and the Thai, the Siamese. It's not about as the media wants to search terrorists down there. It's a clash between two kingdoms. kingdoms. I'll show you some very graphic pictures. Uh, this is how conflict is taking place in southern Thailand. Is a mosque was that the militants had secured themselves in the mosque, and then the army came and attacked them. This is reality. This is what communication does. This is another conflict uh, in the same part in southern Thailand. People were put up in the mosque and uh, attacked in the mosque, and they died. It happens on both sides of religion. It's a real challenge for religions which say we are for peace or we are for tolerance. This is the army. Everyone is attacked. I don't want my children to go out to schools like this, my grandchildren, where they are escorted by the army. Think of the mind which is being formed here. If it's your, your brother, your son, you can think about the world we are creating through and these are pictures, that's what I'm showing. I'm, I didn't take them. I got it from a journalist, a Thai, a Thai journalist. Uh, it's not moving. <laughs> okay. This is how Buddhist monks go to collect arms this morning, every morning. They have never, Buddha never went this way with an army protection. This is how people practice their religion today. So what, where is the, what kind of communication is going on? Monks are attacked. Sorry about this graphic picture. Monks who are going to collect arms. It's on the both sides. So there's a peace talk, <laughs> but they, there's no peace. Peace to end all peace. 
Myanmar in news because of ethnic differences and conflict. It's not only about Rohingya, it's about 135 groups which can't live together. This is Rohingya, case in Arakan state where people who have been living together, Muslims and Buddhists, for centuries suddenly they are at each other's throats. A monk saying no to Rohingya, I don't want them. There's a pathological hatred towards the Rohingya, I say to the Indians, because they call them Kala. Kala means dark skin. This is racism. This is not Buddhism at all. Sri Lanka has the same problem. A monk who is so anti-Muslim wants to kick them out. You never see a monk behaving like that. So, there will be no peace among nations without peace among religions, the famous saying of Hans Kung. So, what's the hope? <laughs> this is the world we are today. Dancers of war, war dancers, war mongers. American friends could relate to that. And a Muslim leader and an American leader. So, what do we do? I'm going to conclude with what I do, a little bit what I do myself. Is, I go with this saying from Rumi who says, the wars of men are like quarrels of children. Both are meaningless and stupid. <laughs> we are in the globalized age. And Rumi said this somewhere in the 13th century. I do conferences between Islam and Buddhism. I did a conference on compassion as a bridge between Islam and Buddhism. This is what I do. I bring people, Muslims, Buddhists, to work together. This is, what I, this is my hope. I, I teach at the Royal Buddhist University, besides the where I work. And I have monk, students who are monks from Myanmar, Cambodia, Vietnam, China. And I take, uh, these are my students. At the beginning, they have all their fears about Islam. But at the end, they become friendly. These are my students. I take them to the mosque. One day, I take them to the mosque to visit to observe the Muslim ritual of prayer on Friday. They told me, sir, we are not going. I said, why? They said, there are bombs in the mosque. <laughs> I said, you go with me. I give you the guarantee. I'm your insurance package. And they went. But it was because of the Bangkok traffic jam, which is not as bad as Manila, they arrived before me. So I said, you guys, please go in. They are waiting for you. They said, no, 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 you come first. And their bus was not air-conditioned, very hot. So I came about half an hour late, and they waited. They did not go inside the mosque. <laughs> they were being to be welcomed. And finally they were received, and received very well. And I end with the saying from the Dalai Lama, our prime promise in this life is to help others. If you can help them, at least don't hurt them. Thank you very much. Now I will request Dr. Su Kyung Han from Korea to make presentation, please. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. And 2010, during the EMI conference in Singapore, I met a man, a man, his name is Vinod Agrawal. He talked to me about the Buddhism in Korea and spreading Buddhism from India to the rest of the world, to Asia, and to Korea. Actually, at that time, I had no interest in Buddhism uh, or religious communication. Of course, my research, research field, the, uh, the journalism and global communication, transnational intercultural communications. But today, not two or a thousand years ago, the back to the uh, Asian time. But since then, we have 
uh, there's so many email contact, and he asked me how about you uh, this joint project to between India and Korea. Oh, please, in Asian time, I have no knowledge on, on this topic. We have no evidence. There's many texts written in classical Chinese. I cannot understand it. There's so much problem I had, so I didn't want it. But now I'm here to with him to show you uh, our material for our joint project, intercultural, uh, intercultural and transnational uh, communication between uh, India and Korea in terms of spreading Buddhism. Yeah, so I show you our materials for our uh, project and we uh, travel to the India and Korea the back to the uh, Asian times. This is the map uh, spreading the Buddhism from India to Asia. And you see just the, the Buddhism uh, the, from India that stretched the floor, uh, to the rest of the world. And to the east, and of the east, um, to Korea and uh, to Japan. And uh, Buddhism in Korea uh, introduced um, in, in time in the period of the three kingdoms. Uh, the first, uh, the between first and uh, the seventh centuries. This is the map at that time. A totally different uh, than now. Uh, the Goguryeo. Is a northern tile of the Korea, and uh, they belong uh, to Goguryeo's. They belong to the part of the China's and uh, uh, Russia. But now is uh, this part is uh, the not uh, the to Korea. And um, picture the uh, southwest tile, and Shilla is the southeast tile, and. Between them, between Baekje and Silla, so there is the, uh, the Kaya. Um, Kaya is a, a confederation, it's not uh, the kingdoms like the other kingdoms. So, in Goguryeo, the, the first kingdoms uh, to adopt the Buddhism so as a royal uh, creed, and um, 372. And Baekje uh, followed the Baekje. Uh, the 384, uh, so from East Sin, uh, now as China, uh, but uh, Marananta uh, uh, by uh, Indian monks. And Sheila, uh, much later, and uh, Nkaya. And Gaya is also was, uh, very interesting because uh, now is that we uh, cannot find any. Uh, uh, evidence, uh, but uh, some scholars suggest uh, probably the uh, Kaya, yes, in Kaya, the, the Buddhism introduced uh, by uh, the Indian monks or directly from India. This is the um, popular story uh, from Kaya in ancient times, it's in the first century. The, the princess uh, the from Ayuda, uh, the from India, um, we guess uh, uh, Uttar Pradesh now, the, in uh, the part of India. And the drama, the, the, um, the princess uh, came to Korea, to Kaya uh, at that time, and uh, the marriage there. 
and she becomes uh, the queen, uh, the wife of uh, King Zuro. Yeah. Yeah, between uh, India and um, uh, the Korea, uh, there were uh, similarities. Uh, do we find um, some fishes, the figure of fishes? Uh, over uh, the picture one is uh, the Hindu temple Ayuda, now Uttar Pradesh in India. Um, and picture two is from uh, China. Uh, the, where the, uh, the princess stayed and uh, they came to Korea, uh, probably. And the picture three, uh, the right below, uh, twin fish, uh, twin figures, twin fish figures, is like um, pictures, uh, like the figures uh, in the Hindu temple in Ayuda. As this is the uh, tomb of the King uh, Kim Su Rose in Kaya. And, uh, and this is the uh, uh, tomb of a king in Kaya. Uh, the princess is from Ayuda, Hoang Ok, his name. And uh, she uh, died there. They married there in Kaya and uh, died there, his tomb is. And uh, coming to the um, historical record uh, so about uh, the Maranatha, the Maranantas uh, uh, came to back there, uh, uh, not uh, directly from India to uh, the back there, the via the China, the from East Zing. Um, many the Indian monks uh, traveled to the China uh, to the preach the Buddhism, and uh, from there, the, from China, as so they came to uh, Korea. And uh, there is a record, a uh, historical record about the Maranantha, uh, Samguk Yusa, uh, Samguk Sagi, and Hedong uh, Gosungjun. But uh, about uh, Maranantha, there was a short description. So we, we don't know so not much money, uh, not much about uh, Maranantha. And other thing is uh, all the records, all the texts were uh, written in uh, classical Chinese. So at that time, the Chinese language uh, they regarded as um, the lingua, franc uh, lingua franca and Asian uh, in East Asia. And in uh, Korea, the, in, in ancient times until now, uh, the, the Korean uh, used uh, the Chinese to uh, communicate with other peoples in uh, other region. Yeah. According to Samguk Sagi, uh, this is description is when Marananta, the Buddhist monk from India, so came to Baekje from Jin in the ninth lunar uh, the month of uh, 384 in the, the coronation year of King Simnu, the king welcomed him into the palace and treated him hospitally, which marked the initiation of Buddhism in Baekje. In February of the following year, a uh, Buddhist temple was built in Hansan, the capital of Baekje, where 10 monks were sent uh, into reside. So, uh, this shows uh, there was uh, uh, really contact, direct contact uh, the, between the Korean monks and the Indian monks. So we uh, generally we uh, uh, know in general we speak yeah it's, uh, the Buddhism that comes uh, from China so not uh, directly from uh, India uh, we said, uh, but uh, there is some uh, indications uh, that shows. Uh, this uh, uh, the different uh, this historical record. We are coming to another um, thing, so the way of Maranatha, the two picture. The Maranatha uh, comes from originally the Gandhara, um, 
the Skandaras, uh, the went to the, the China, the uh, East Asian, and uh, from there, uh, they went to the back there. And um, this is the, the way to the, the birthplace of back there, Buddhism, with uh, following this, uh, uh, this way, and uh, we uh, arrived at this port, yeah, the Marananta arrived at this port in uh, the 384. The word uh, Bobsong Po, uh, this port is uh, Bobsong Po. Uh, Bobsong means a Buddhist saint, referring Marananta. And, and this uh, temple is um, uh, Bulgapsa, the first uh, uh, Buddhist temple in the picture. And Bulgapsa was built in the holy pal uh, palace. In the holy uh, place where Marananta uh, found the Buddhism in Bekje. And in Bulgapsa, the only in this region, in Jolanamdo, uh, uh, in the uh, southern uh, province of in Korea, and uh, with some architectures, uh, or according to, uh, uh, to Indian style, um, the Gandhara temple in Korea, this uh, imitated. Uh, uh, Gandhara temples in uh, Gandhara, and actually, it's an imitation. And, and uh, these pictures, uh, these uh, Buddha statues, uh, so normally we have a Buddha statues, uh, uh, it's a Korean uh, influenced by uh, Chinese tradition, cultural traditions, or the Korean uh, uh, the styles. But uh, this uh, Buddha is uh, Indian style. And also, this uh, uh, statue is uh, also in uh, Indian style. And, and this is the Gandhara architecture. So, uh, we have built no, a new. Yes. The, um, and uh, since then, uh, the Marananta came to, to Bekze, and after that, uh, 140 years old. Uh, the, years long, we had no evidence that for uh, activities in uh, Buddhism, uh, spreading Buddhism, was uh, to uh, preach the uh, Buddhist. And uh, come to the uh, Kyomik, the Kyomik is a monk uh, from Baekje. Uh, he, uh, he is the founder of um, the Vinaya order. Um, he uh, the, went to uh, the and uh, try to uh, travel to India uh, to uh, learn uh, more the, the Buddhism. And um, he uh, came back to uh, the picture uh, so that we had the Korean, uh, <laughs> the Indian monks, and uh, we the, the bring the, uh, many Buddhist texts and the statues. And he translated in. Uh, this text is in uh, in Chinese, in Chinese, and most of the text is now in uh, Sanskrit, written in Sanskrit, and translated the, into uh, classical Chinese. Because uh, we uh, had in Korea, in Korea, uh, we had no uh, own character at that time. Yes, and um, this the um, way of Hetu, the monk from Shila. Um, he uh, traveled to uh, India, uh, the five kingdoms of India, and back uh, the, to the China, uh, and uh, the following the, the Silk Road. Yes. Uh, Hato studied uh, esoteric Buddhism um, in China, uh, and uh, there, uh, as uh, met um, Indian monks, the Indian uh, masters, the Mesoteric of the Buddhism, and, and uh, he, uh, after that, he decided that, uh, that to travel to India, to the land of the Buddha. And uh, this is the, uh, the text Wang uh, Chongchu Gukjon, the memoirs of the pilgrimage to the, uh, the five kingdoms of India, uh, the from uh, 726. Yeah, uh, had to travel is the written in uh, classical in uh, classical Chinese also. So now it's in the world after 
uh, to uh, uh, 1,200 years uh, after. Um, by the Paul, the Paul, without the French plural, explorer. Um, yes, this is the material. Uh, we show the, uh, yes, and this is the um, uh, evidence uh, uh, the, for the interaction between the, the Korea and, uh, and um, I India, uh, spreading uh, the Buddhism. Yes, uh, that's what I want to show you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, just before finishing her talk, I should add two lines to you. Oral tradition or orality was the key of the spread of Buddhism and other religions in the world. And second thing, that merchants played a very important role in spreading Buddhism from India to the rest of Asia. Uh, all historical records indicate that the monks went along with the merchants and traders to other countries because they were already doing, and the merchants act as a bilingual interpreters for them, are the people who are ser uh, serving with them. Thank you so much. And now I'll request Dr. Israel to please present your paper. That will be followed by Dr. Dorji's few minutes of comment, if you have any, and the rest of the panel. Thank you. Um, good morning to my fellow presenters. And uh, good morning to all of us. Magandang umaga sa ating lahat. Of course, you should clap at me. Once again, let me welcome you to Miriam College, where I graduated when it was still known as Marinol College. And for some stable reason, my name remains Lorna Israel. I'm honored to share my thoughts to you this morning. Don't worry, I am not going to tell them in silence. But I will keep silent in due time. Philosophy deals with ideas and the wisdom behind them. In other words, words of wisdom. Asia's words of wisdom are very economical and space-saving. Conveyed in sayings or proverbs, they do not consume that much time, letters, or papers. You can easily send them on Twitter and other social media. And they have unseen, mysterious, and ghost-like or godlike potency, as noted by the late uh, Benedict Anderson, a Southeast Asian scholar, who observed its prevalence in the Asian region. To the Ifugao, a Filipino indigenous community in northern Luzon, or northern Philippines, words can harm or kill. Thus, they build an imagined wall to protect them from the curses of their enemies. Asian words of wisdom also come in short stories like the Zen stories. A professor of philosophy in an Australian university encounters the magical potency of Zen stories. He calls it a ghost. Zen stories, he writes, though saying a lot, also contain a lot of unsayable. They sound right but resist verbal explanation. He demands words for the unassayable in order to put the ghost to rest. Of course, I'm not going to say his name. But the biblical passage warns, the more words, the less meaning, and how does it profit anyone? The Mahatma, does the Mahatma Gandhi spoke, speak only if it improves 
upon the silence. The 11th century Rabbi Solomon ibn Gabriel positioned silence as the first stage in seeking wisdom. The sacred Kabbalistic text, the Book of Silence, begins its teaching by encouraging readers to study the fine art of silence. Because out of silence comes hearing, out of hearing comes understanding, out of understanding comes wisdom. The Book of Silence teaches two kinds of silences the silence of the mouth and the silence of the mind. However, a silent mouth does not necessarily entail a silent mind. A silent mind always accompanies a silent mouth. Thus, the Book of Silence identifies three kinds of learners. One, the fool, who is not silent in mouth or mind, Two, the hearing impaired, whose mouth is silent, but not the mind. And third, the listener, who is silent in both mind and mouth. I'm sure you can identify yourselves in one of these three kinds of learners. You might say that the fool and the hearing impaired, with all due respect, because, and I, don't mean, I do not mean to be res respectful because most of the time I'm either a fool or a hearing impaired, are those who think loudly and the listener allows thinking to proceed. Those loud thinkers, ironically speaking, also make us silent. Like me, for example, no? Putting us in a communication theory called the spiral of silence. Conceived by Elizabeth Newman, the spiral of silence talks about the silence of those whose views are contrary to the majority. They fear isolation or punishment or being trolled or bashed in the social media as the case nowadays. As the media plays a significant role in shaping public opinion, which is basically the opinion of the majority, the silence or the spiral of silence consists them that they're relegating the minority to the spiral of silence. In the cyber world, the opposite of the spiral of silence operates. Those with minority opinion, the vocal minority, never seem to shut up. Who is not to say that the internet is where thinking aloud is the communicative norm. In fact, there is a company in the internet whose business is to cater to the business of thinking aloud, the noise agency. So the noise agency can help you to meet these challenges and achieve your goals while delivering a more interactive, informative, and fulfilling customer experience. In other words, this business of noise no, doesn't find anything noisy about noise. It is, in fact, very profitable for it. The present world takes pride in being highly technologized, where communication and information lines flow seamlessly and endlessly. But these technologies do not seem to have a space for silence. Is there an app already available in your devices for this silence? There is a Filipino saying, Kapag ang dagat ay malalim, asahan mo at malalim. Silent water runs deep. Immersed in our noisy mind and mouth, we are drowning 
and falling and failing to listen to the depth of the ocean's silence. And the implication is clear. What words of wisdom can we communicate if silence has no room? The Buddha was supposed to have said that he did not say anything. That despite saying a lot of sutras or discourse, that he did not teach anything despite devoting his life to teaching. Actually, if he did say or teach anything, he might just be repeating what basically makes the mind sick and makes us noisy and loud. Words and ideas they contain. And that is why he claimed he did not utter a single word. In other words, the Buddha was basically silent. In this highly technologized world, speed is a determining element. We might say that the present world that we know can be described as modern, challenged with modernity, and speed is one of the defining marks of modernity. And speed undermines the space for silence. Silence where one can enhance moments of reflection, understanding, and wisdom, where one listens instead of simply hearing. We are always in a hurry. The imperative of a text message is an immediate reply. We apologize for replying after an hour, we annotate a picture posted on FB as late post. A news in progress is called breaking news, which instantly excites us with dread and anxiety for what is breaking news, but an instance of speed. It calls us to speed up because anxiety is bursting our thoughts. Our technologized world is governed by dromology, or the logic of speed, as conceptualized by the French philosopher Paul Virilio, and the technological devices we use drives us to become dromomaniacs, or addicted to speed. So in our dromological world, one is bound to be late, one is never on time, because speed operates outside the logic of time. So I think it's time for me to stop talking, but I leave you with another Filipino words of wisdom. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sen. Uh, I will request Dr. Dorji to respond to two questions that have been raised. I will request the questioner to come on this side and ask the question to him directly. Please. I have a paper saying two questions have been asked in his case. Are these questions are for the se plenary session two? Doctor, uh, doctor um, uh, silence. <laughs> Can I, uh, yeah. the, uh, I have a f just a few uh, points uh, to make, doctor, this, um, after, after these uh, very substantial um, academic presentations, mine's going to be an idiot's view of uh, spiritual and philosophical uh, perspective of communications. You know, the, uh, for a preparation of, to prepare for the session, what I actually did was I talked to three friends, three monk scholars, and after talking to them very briefly each, I r thought that I had wasted a lot of time going to college uh, studying communications and uh, journalism. <clears throat> the, uh, the perspectives of, uh, perspective of communication so clear in the, I spoke to them only a few minutes each, and these are some of the points which I picked up. 
Um, and many of them have been actually uh, outlined in more detail uh, by the other uh, speakers. Um, I thought if we, if we were a little, this mindful communication would make us better uh, journalists, better media professionals, better people. The, the whole premise is that communication is part of uh, everyday life, it's important for the functioning of society. And uh, the 2,600 years ago, you know, the uh, Buddha did a, a teaching, 60. When he started teaching, he taught at different levels. I mean, he was very, very conscious, apparently, of the level, different levels of the audience. And that was the, that was the Buddhism approach to teaching. And, um, you know, at different categories, 60 qualities of speech, and so much of it is uh, very relevant today. As, you know, be, to be eloquent, to choose the right words, don't speak too much or too little, don't contradict yourself, be correct, be clear, don't use harsh or cruel words. Uh, be logical, pertinent, free of redundancy. You know, this kind of all, uh, this what, uh, is what actually is also being taught in communications today. The ap approach apparently is communications, the perspective is communications is the medium, but the message, the, the content is the most important. And the purpose of communications, which is to, well, enlightenment. Um, if I may share Vajrayana, in Bhutan we practice Vajrayana Buddhism, sometimes called crazy wisdom, and they talk about three modes of communications. One is the enlightenment, enlightened beings, you know, speak from mind to mind. They don't actually need to speak or, or uh, use voice, words. Then the bodhisattvas who use um, signs, symbols for their communications, and then common people like us who use, uh, who need language, script. Okay, uh, if, I, if, if this mic is not working, I'll just uh, shout louder. And uh, for lay people like us, the, the oral you know, communication system being started, which eventually came to uh, script and writing. Um, what, one very brief point I'd like to make is uh, also through, uh, from drawing on my own experience, in Asian societies, there's a very important concept of self-censorship, which is used as, uh, as a, this uh, philosopher, Ruth Bendict said that uh, the Western society is a uh, uh, guilt-oriented society, Asian society is shame-oriented society. So very often, it's important that we keep this in mind and use self-censorship to avoid uh, you know, well, to help people save face, because the, the worst, often the confrontational approach uh, that media often take doesn't help. It aggravates the situation. Mm. And in terms of being mindful, which has been mentioned several times, what I understand being mindful was, they say four elements, listening to yourself, using silence as a part of speech, listening to others, and speaking very slowly and clearly. And in terms of te technology, use of technology, that uh, spiritual practice being very flexible in many ways, you are open to use any technology. Okay. Uh, from the questions, yes. In the in the, my last word is in the age of social media. If we keep in mind some of these uh, some of these guidelines, I think social the uh, policies. Guide, guide policies for social media are really policies, are guidelines to being a good human being. Thank you. But you still we have about 15 minutes, am I right? Time is over. Okay. So I'm very sorry the time is over. The only request I will make during tea time, you can ask all our presenters. If there's a very pressing question, one or two, I can take right away. Please. One question, one or two questions. Yeah, go Thank ahead. Thank you. Um, I appreciate all the panelists for this uh, significant discussion today. 
I have my first uh, comment is uh, directed to uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Franz Joseph Eilers. Uh, in in one of your earlier slide, you mentioned that uh, you, you you wrote uh, Muhammad's book. Uh, I want to cl clarify that in, in, in Islam beliefs, it's not his book. It's uh, Allah's book, Kitabullah. So uh, that's, I think, very important uh, to, to, to be clarified. Secondly, I would like to uh, comment on Dr. Yusuf's uh, statement that we are being modernized by accident. I think that's uh, true and maybe we can also tracing back uh, why in the past time there is very peaceful coexistence between uh, among religions and now why there is uh, conflict uh, among us. Maybe uh, uh, one of the way to, to solve the problem, I think um, we have to focus we have to also pay our attention uh, as much to learn how our ancestor uh, can uh, live uh, together peacefulness okay. uh, like uh, they used to be. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will ask one of the presenters to very quickly respond to him and then we'll stop at this point because you have to take a photograph, I'm told. Uh, my, my answer to the question is why we are colonized, uh, we, are, we are modern by accident, and why there is there was no conflict or different situation before colonization. I would say before we lived as kingdoms, not as ethnic groups and, race, and races. What colonialism did is that it, it ethnicized religions. You are a Malay, you are a Muslim, you are a Thai, you are a Buddhist, you are a Filipino, you are a Catholic. Actually, Filipinos are Malays. Many people don't know that. So you had this kind of living together, the Dharma Raja or the Sultan or the king, Christian king, they cared for everybody under their rule. But today we look at each other by our ethnicity. As I told you, I'm born in Africa, and they ask me why you're not black. This is a racist statement. They don't look me at as a human being. That's the difference today. Yeah. Thank you so much. And at this point, I request uh, all the presenters to be in the front because the ceremony of photograph taking that you have to be here. Okay. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, another warm round of applause for our eminent speakers and moderators while we request them to please, yes, uh, follow the line here in front, upstage, so that a short photo opportunity will... Uh, will happen now please do not do not forget to use hashtag amycon 2017 and hashtag rethinking communication if you wish to upload the photos for your social media accounts Thank you very much. All right, so at this point, we will move to the next session. Right. So we now prepare for, our, for the Google Talk on Innovation in Communications in Asia. Thank you very much to our eminent speakers and moderator. Another warm round of applause as our speakers and moderator exit the stage. We'll just have a quick clearing of our stage here so that we can prepare for our next session. All right. So once again, we are 
in Google Talk, Innovation in Communications in Asia. Allow me to introduce to you the speaker. Via Gail T. Tan. Gail is the head of communications and public affairs at Google Philippines, responsible for all communication strategies and activities, including on social media, and oversees the same for Google Thailand. She has over 18 years of experience in public relations and marketing communications. Before taking on her current role as Google, at Google, rather, Gail was a TV producer, scriptwriter, and communication strategies for two Philippine presidents. Gail finished her master's degree in management at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 2011, where she also worked as a social media manager for a former National Security Council director who served during the United States President Bill Clinton's administration. The next information about her is very close to my heart. Gail has a degree in communication arts from Miriam College, where she was awarded the departmental award for garnering the highest GPA for communication arts. I am but a very proud teacher and colleague, as she also taught in the department for about a year. She earned her master's in public management at the University of the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Via Gail T. Tan. Hi, good morning. As you might have heard, I am from Google. So I'm here to disrupt your life even further. Because I've heard the name Google mentioned several times earlier in the context of disruption. So for this morning, you will be disrupted. And if that's your thing, you're in good hands. If it's not, then you'll be a little bit uncomfortable. So I apologize for that. Let me begin by giving you a heads up. At Google, we value data a lot. We don't bring out anything without doing research behind it. So you'll be seeing a lot of the boring numbers and graphs that I have for you. The other thing is that I will need audience participation. So in the meantime, could you please look behind, I mean, under your seat, if there's anything there. I, I suppose you have to stand because it has to flip. There's nothing? I'm pretty sure there's nothing. I just wanted blood to flow to your feet once again and then up to your head. But I do have four Google phones with me, so I need four volunteers. I have with me Pia and Kissy who will be selecting these four. Please raise your hand if you want to volunteer. I have four phones. Pia, Kizzy, please look at where they are. Hold on to those phones. I would just like to clarify, now that you have raised your hands and you've been selected, you're not going to keep them, but I do have something else to give you instead. And you will be participants of our presentation today, which will come a little bit later. Now, there is this notion that Google is the internet. I just want to clarify that the internet was invented way before Google. But the inventor of the internet, Vince Cerf, happens to be at Google. He is my colleague. And he is our chief information evangelist. So if you say there's no religion at Google, we do have an evangelist at Google. In the beginning of my presentation, I would like you to pause for a while, silence, as Professor Israel said earlier, and watch this video. और उसके बाद जाके यूसुफ के दुकान से जजरिया चुरा के खानी जजरिया और मेरा साहब नमस्ते नमस्ते, नमस्ते। मेरी पोती मुंबई वाली और बेटे क्या हाल चाल है बचपन 
की तंग गली फिर से कूद फांदे छोटी छोटी मीठी चोरी गांठ लेके बांधे हेलो अस्सलाम वालेकुम फजल स्वीट्स हां जी दादा जान दिल्ली से किसी की कॉल है हेलो यूसुफ अंकल कौन जी मैं सुमन बोल रही हूँ दिल्ली से आपके बचपन के दोस्त बलदेव जी की पोती याद है बचपन में आप दोनों जजरिया चुरा के खाते थे बचपन में की तंग गली फिर से कूद फांदे छोटी छोटी मीठी चोरी गांठ लेके बांधे एक पतंग सा उड़ता था परिंदो की तरह परिंदो की तरह परिंदो की तरह एक दौर था मन मन मोर था 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 के वक्त हम रातों रात हिंदुस्तान आ गए यूसुफी बड़ी आ जाती है कागजों की कश्तियों में डूब रह I can go to my seat now but that is exactly what Google is about we care about our users we care about everybody the information we give people and the communication that forms and the relationship in there is all because we value life and the moments that we build in it good morning everyone the internet as i said earlier was created before google can we put my slides back in 2000 three or four internet users belonged in rich countries in 2015 two of three users lived in developing countries now why am i presenting this to you the state of the internet shows so much the state of the world right now and as i said earlier we did not invent it but we were able to identify a key thing and a moment that we can use to be able to help people get through their lives quicker, simpler and maybe make it more meaningful. I was reading the program days ago and I saw the messages about trying to go back to our roots and making sure that as we move forward that we take our culture and make sure that it is represented one way or another and that it is not diluted by the western world and as an asian i love that because you know what at google we recognize that the growth of the internet population is extremely quick this data was taken in march 2017 and it says that in the last 5 years which means march 2012 our internet population grew by 1.7 billion people on the right on my right your left you'll see the state of the internet right now in terms of population globally we are 7.6 billion people on the internet there are i'm sorry i keep on looking back there are 3.8 billion people on the other side is our aspiration that in 3 years time 
when we reach 8 billion people, then there would be 8 billion people in the internet. Now, why are we so adamant about this? It's because we know that right now, you can no longer look back and say, I wish there was no internet. It's there. It's like when we had our electricity. There's no way you can turn off the light and say, I don't want electricity. The way we live our life is influenced by the amount of light we have in our homes, the electricity that powers everything right now that is electric in here. And it's the same with the internet. The kind of exchange of messages, information, and culture is heavily reliant on the internet. It's democratizing. It's a level field for everyone. And if there are those who are not online, then that means those people are missing out on opportunities that they can have if they are online. The technology advancement is quite surprising. In this photo, you'll see two events, one that happened in 2008 during the Beijing Olympics, and I'm sure you'll notice that everyone has a video camera or a digital camera. In just four years, during the London Olympics, everybody was holding what? A smartphone. That's the kind of technology we have. In four years, no one wants to use a digital camera anymore. And then in the next Olympics, just recently in 2016, we're still using the smartphone, but our focus is now different. Instead of it being focused outward, we're taking selfies with our athletes. That is how things are. And people are so easy to adapt into the swift change of technology. And we would like to, for you to know that this is one value that we can really grasp and make sure that we can incorporate as we move forward, trying to make sure that communication in Asia is what it should be. Here are some data. People right now are mostly on mobile. We say mobile first, which means that when they get into the internet, the first thing that they use to get to the internet is now a smartphone. And you know why? Because it's cheaper than a desktop. It's pretty much mobile. You can bring it anywhere. And it gives you information anywhere you are. And it gives you also the chance to communicate and exchange relationship regardless of how you feel about it being online, but it brings, you bring it everywhere. Now, we also say that we are going towards a mobile only, not just mobile first, but mobile only, wherein people will finally feel there is no need for anything else but their smartphones. And guess what? The next billion people who will be going online are actually coming from Asia. Now, this is what I was telling you about. We don't do things at Google simply because we want to. There are research, there are data that we use to make sure that once we do a product or offer our services, which mostly are free anyway, we make sure that it's being brought to the people who will use it. And we have seen, and I will show you a lot of data later on, that the next bunch of people, the next billion, is definitely coming from this region. So what am I saying? Our ecosystem right now is digital. It has long been digital since the internet was created, but it is only now that we're feeling the disruption. That's how long it took. But in the next couple of years, five years maybe, it's gonna go even faster which is why we're even thinking that it may be possible that the 8 billion population we have in 2020 will all be online, hopefully. The approach that you use in communication will have to em embrace the whole notion that you're working in a digital ecosystem because otherwise the messages that you do will fall flat. Consider everything that you heard earlier, the value of culture, the value of religion, the value of language, but do consider as well that you're already moving in a digital ecosystem. What are people doing online? I'm sure, as most of you have mentioned earlier, we're all on social. This is the statistics that we are social sent out. But more than social media, of course, we did our own research. They're also doing a lot 
of searching on their mobile phones. Now, if you look at the data that we have, the people who spend most time searching on their mobile phones for information, mind you, I didn't say knowledge, information, because knowledge is up to the person and how you use the information, critical thinking, analysis, dilution of the noise, all of that is reliant on the person. But the medium that we're using, which is all very basic in communication, the internet, people are using it to search for the things that matters to them. Let's take a look at this graph. South Korea, China, Singapore, Taiwan, top four are all in Asia. They're all on their mobile phones searching. And just to be very precise about this, the research that we did, the one at least that I'm presenting to you is on the mobile phone because of the idea that a majority of people are now doing their internet online activities on their mobile phones and not anymore on desktop. So next thing that they do online is they also use maps to find direction. They want to get to somewhere and it's so convenient to just bring out their phone and look and guess what? Again, South Korea, Singapore, Australia, if you consider Asia Pacific, Hong Kong, before the US. These are all data, it's research. It's not man, it, we didn't make it up from thin air, thin air. Next, they watch video on mobile. Now, why is video important? I'll tell you later, but mostly it has something to do with culture. But if you see, Thailand loves watching videos on mobile. China loves watching video on mobile. Is Dr. Yusuf here? We can talk later about why we are not in China, the real reason. And then we have Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam, Hong Kong, Taiwan, you can go on. We love watching videos more than our American and European brothers. And when we watch videos, whether it is less than five minutes or more than 10 minutes, look at that. Philippines is actually number two. We do love our videos, don't we? And what else do we do online? This may come as a surprise to you, but we also shop online. So things are changing. It is a digital ecosystem that we are in. And if you are going to prepare your communication for the world, and especially for Asia, you have to consider that there is a digital sphere that you're moving in. You cannot deny it anymore. At Google, there are four things that we think when you put together is essential to reaching out to our next billion users. I'll take care of the first one. I'll discuss channels, which is the technology. And I, and I challenge the others to consider the rest of those on this screen when you think of communication in the future for Asia. Let's first discuss channel or technology and what Google is doing for the next billion users. We build for the billion. We have a team called Next Billion Users. All they do is travel around the world. Woo, <laughs> that's, that may sound really great, right? But what they do is go to the areas where people don't normally go, especially in Asia, because these are the people that we want to reach and say, hey, there's actually an opportunity for you to reach information that you have not had before, and we can do it in a very simple way. What we do is to make sure that the products we build for the next billion users is for everyone. What does that mean? We consider internet speed, of course, because that's heavily the foundation of how the transaction happens online. Asia is very peculiar in this aspect. I don't know if you can see the first three or four, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, they have the fastest internet connection that is on LAN and Wi-Fi. And if you look at the other end, the slowest connection, you see Philippines and India. 
So in Asia, we both have the fastest and the slowest connections in the world. So our team, the Next Billion Users team, consider connections as one of the key things. If you're already in South Korea or Japan or Singapore, you already have fast connection, then we give you the products that will suit your needs. If you're not still online, and believe you me, there are still percentage of people who are not online even in these um, developed countries. And then when you go to the developing countries, we go to the areas where it's so hard to get infrastructure for connections, and then we try to see how we can work with different sectors of society and even government to bring that technology into these areas. Now, see this other one. This now is the speed on data, mobile data. I'm sure it will come as a surprise to you that number two is the Philippines. So let me disrupt you today. After UK, when you are on data, you have a greater chance of viewing things more than our brothers in other countries. So that's again another data that you have to consider if you are creating communication materials and putting it online and your target will be people in different countries, how big is your file? How fast is your video? Are they going to do it online through mobile phones or through desktop? So these are the things that you really have to consider. You can't just rely on ideas sometimes and theories. You have to have research and data to back it up so that you will have an effective message coming across. When we talk about building for the billion, we think of many things, but the two things that I wanted to present to you right now is to think slow and to go offline. And because of the, state, uh, the statistics that I, sent, uh, that I shared with you earlier, it clearly shows that if we want the people, the next billion, to be able to participate and partake into the democratized information that is going around worldwide, then you have to consider that they have slow internet. So if they have slow internet, what can we do as Google to make sure that their slow internet can actually accommodate the kind of information that is out there. And then the other one is to go offline. I did not show any statistics or data in here, but I can tell you that data in the Philippines is pretty expensive. Can I hear a yes from the students? Yes, they're pretty expensive, and the tendency of people is to actually turn off their data when they're not using it, and then turn it on again if they want to check their feed, if they want to check the news, the weather, if they want to go somewhere so that they can use maps. Which means, if we want information to be accessible to everyone, and they're online, and you need internet connection to get there, then you have to provide those information even if when they're not online. So our solution is that we made search faster for certain countries. That means, Heavy images will not be loading in high resolution, and we already put the technology behind that. We did not put it upon the content creator to make it that way. Our technology will minimize the pixels to make sure that once you search for something, it is 10 times, le 10 times less in consumption of data, and it is 33% quicker when you upload it or when you download it. We also have, I don't know if you know this, but we have made maps and YouTube available for you offline. If you're going on a trip and you know that you're going to be in your car for three hours and you don't want to use your data for three hours so that Google Maps or Waze can help you go point per point, then you can download that area where you're go from where you're coming from to where you're going to, download it on Maps, make it offline, and it will be available for you for the next day, four days or one week or so. And it's the same with YouTube. If, for example, whether it is for entertainment or education, if you find a video that you like and you need to watch it later or you want to watch it later, you can click on a button and then make it available for you when you are ready to watch it, even if you're not connected. Why did we do this? Again, because we know that the next billion users will be coming from developing countries. We've identified them, and most of them are coming from Asia. Now, content. We make sure that content is local and relevant. There is really no more excuse 
to say that the Western people have invaded our internet in our country because there are so many platforms that is available for everyone to make sure that content is local and relevant. Content is king, is what we always say at YouTube. What you put in there is what you want to say. And if what you put in there is who you are as Asian people, then what people are watching and picking up is content from Asian people. Your language, your culture, your norms, your desires, your aspirations, your song, your entertainment, everything is going to be about you. We have a site called Google Cultural Institute. We partner with institutions across the world and I'm proud to say that we work with a lot of them in Asia. In fact, we have placed a lot of Indonesian culture in there so that people who are not from Asia can appreciate what we are made of as Asian people. We also have even those things that you will not find in museums like street art in the Philippines. We work with a group of street art artists and we ask them if they are willing put their work online and make it available for everyone. When MMDA and DOTC have already washed away the walls, we still have them on, on Google Cultural Institute. And then on maps, we use Street View to put things that are very local. Let's take, for example, Sakura in Japan. Even if you're not in Japan, you will be able to see what's actually going on when there is sakura in Japan, when it's the season for the cherry blossoms. You can take a tour, and then on YouTube, this is what I was telling you, Thailand being the number one people on this planet who actually love to watch a lot of YouTube, they have millions of viewers of their content online. And mind you, not one of them is in English. They're all in Thai. And not one of them is about Western culture. They're all about Thai culture. That's what I was saying. The culture we have on the internet as Asian people relies on us. So when you make your plans and your vision, and you, when you build your vision for the future to make things work for the Asian people, Please consider, you can use the internet to put relevant content, relatable content, and we have the platforms there for you to use. Now, language. If someone can tell me, I have something to give away, if someone can tell me, ballpark figure, round number, how many languages, Asian languages we have that are living, spoken, and used, I will have something for you. Can I see a show of hands? Pia or Kisi will come to you and ask for that number. How many Asian languages do we have that are spoken, that are used, that are read, published? You see a guess? Come on, take a guess. You can Google it if you want. <laughs> if you have the connection, because data is expensive, I know. 1,000 here, 2,000 there, 10,000, anyone else? 3,000 will give that price to 2,000. There are 2,197 languages in Asia that are spoken, that are used, maybe not as popularly as others, but imagine there are so much communication going on that's very specific to us. But then, when you use communication, you have to always think that language is what sets you apart. It's what makes your communication or your message matter and meaningful. It's the language that you use. It has to be understood, and it has to have an identity that someone can relate to. Unfortunately, okay, first let me give you the statistics. The breakdown of the internet right now, the population, almost half of the population of the world online is from Asia. And as I told you, another billion is gonna go online and they're also mostly coming from Asia. 49.7% according to this research that was done on June 2017. 
North America has 8.2%. Europe has 17%. Latin America, 10%, and then the rest of the world. Not that I want to just like clump them all together, but space wise and aesthetic wise, it didn't fit. So the rest of the world is 14%. 49.7% per, is coming from Asia. Now, look at this. More than half of the content of the world online is in English. What are we doing about it? You can't just point fingers and blame people. You're putting too much English content online. There may be many reasons behind that, but then again, the challenge is on us. We have more than 2,000 languages, why aren't they online? Now, half of the content is English, and if you recall the, the map earlier, German is represented here at 6.4, Russian is represented at 5, Spanish at 4.7, French at 4.2, Portuguese, Italian. That means clumped all together, it's more than half of the percentage of languages online, not Asian, it's not Asian. So the challenge is now on us. At Google, our platforms were made sure to work in different languages. And we work with content creators to make sure that their languages are there. And we work with our engineers to make sure that when they do search in Hindi, or in Kapampangan, that something will come out one way or another. Now the problem is Google is not content creators. We do not create content. We are all platform. So sometimes when people ask us, why is it that when we search we can't find this? Eh, well, we only give you what's there. If it's not there, we can't give it to you. So if you want, for example, some people would come to me, we have to have Ilocano online and all. You have to create the content. In order for Google to search it, and then give it to someone who's looking for Ilocano content. So the challenge is there now. You have to create content. The next thing, I want to show you this video again. And then I'll tell you about one of those things that we're very controversial about. This is in a different language, not an Asian language, but you can do the same with any Asian language that is, um, that is that are major, that is found online. Now, I know there's a controversy here because sometimes you go and translate and then, ah, oh, it doesn't really mean that. And you know it because you own the language, and that is a great thing. Not many people know that Google Translate is not just all about technology, it's also human crowdsourced information. What we have is an app that has over 500 million users with 1 billion translations daily. We have 90 different languages and 300 million app downloads 
as of maybe like two or three years ago. So this, this stats is not updated, but it gives you an idea. But then again, like I said, it's an app, it's crowdsourced. So I dare you once again, we have a translate community. You can go to google.com.ph and then slash translate or translate at google.com.ph or if you're from another country, you can just change that to whatever URL you're using for Google and then put translate at the end or in front. And then, please, if you value your language and you want it to be represented, then put it online. Put the right combinations in there for English translated to your language or your language translated to English. We did this once again because we know the value of being local and being culturally sensitive. There are nuances and thoughts behind words that sometimes computer cannot understand. So don't blame the computer because there is actually a way that you can change this. You just go online and make sure that the translations are correct. And then, as most crowdsourced uh, technology goes, there would be moderators and they'll make sure that the, that the translation is actually accurate. You can do your thing, you can do your, your contribution to make sure that your language is represented online by doing this. Now, experience and moments. I don't know exactly who said earlier, but it's something to do with like the swiftness of things and all that, like everything seems, oh, the professor, professor Israel was talking about how everything's like breaking news and then you have to apologize if it's late or what. And I do agree, sometimes you, you know, if it's, if it's late, it's late. But there's also something about the human component of treasuring moments as they come. And sometimes, I mean, don't you, don't you remember before when we used to have snail mail? Somebody has a great news, they write it, and then they send it. Especially in the Philippines, it takes about a month, or maybe you never even received that letter. In other countries that are more efficient, it takes about a day or two. But with the use of mobile internet right now, you can, you can tell everybody that you had a, a baby. You can tell everybody you got engaged or that you graduated. So moments and experiences are very critical and very important to our culture as Asian people because we are so community um, founded and we are so, we value family so much. So if something happens to our brothers, to our sisters, to our aunt, our grandpa, we want to be able to get it, like it's breaking news for us. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that in that context. As the video that I showed earlier, we as Asians, like we will do anything that we can to make sure that our loved ones feel loved or are in the moment, it's like having, having a good moment because of the things that we value. So like for example, spending time with family, so experience and moments should not be disregarded when you create communication and if you think of messages to give, it's just us as Asian people to be very conscious of how other people feel or think at the moment. And I'll show you another video. This is not Asian though, but I mean, it's almost Christmas. You know, when we reach Burr, it's almost Christmas in the Philippines. So let's watch this video and let me walk you through something after that. Have you sent your letter to Santa yet? No. I forgot. You forgot. Did you make your list for Santa? Mm -hmm. Who's there? Is that? That's Santa. What? Yeah. I think he wants you to answer. Can you slide that up? Hello, Santiago. What is Isa? Is that Justin? Oh, I didn't know your name. Is that Sophia? Are you in New York? Should I drop that off for you in Brooklyn? <sighs> Will you be knitting your dog Candy a sweater? Is that the plan? How do you know? Isa, could you put your hands over your ears, please? Has she been good this year? Yeah. The only thing is that she bites me a lot. Have you two been brushing your teeth? Go uh... on. Yeah, okay. Looks good. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Santa. Feliz Navidad. Merry Christmas. Bye-bye, Christmas, Santa. Merry Christmas.
Christmas. Bye bye. That was so cool. That was awesome. Hello, that is Google Duo, and I gave out four phones earlier. I just want to do a real live demo right now. What it makes is that it gives you a moment that even before you answer the call, you already know what's happening. And that is very important when, for example, you have a breaking news. Like something is on fire, your editor, if you're a journalist, is not picking up the phone, he doesn't know what's happening, not reading your text, but if he sees you, while the phone is ringing and there is a fire at, the, uh, at, the, at your back and you can actually show it. Where are the four, um, I can't see much from where I am, but where are the four volunteers? Okay, so let's just do a really quick call because the next session is about to start. So someone is gonna call someone else and then you have to show, you have to tell us what you're seeing. Where is the, where, are you calling? Who's calling whom? So, okay, so now you're calling each other. You can actually see. Can you tell us? Can you come up here and tell us what you're seeing? Who's calling who? You're calling her? So you're calling her and you haven't picked up. Oh, you have now. Can you call her again? And then where are the other two? Can you do the same? Call your partner? No, no, because like, can you tell us what you see even if you haven't picked up yet? Uh, I see the home screen, so. So, but earlier when she was calling you, you actually saw her before you yeah. picked up. So, what I just wanted to show is that this is actually working. It's not just any gimmick that we did with Santa, and it's not just for kids. Okay, so now it's working now. Did, did it work for you? That worked for you. Okay, so, can you, did you actually pick it up yet? Okay, so, but earlier you saw him before you picked up. All right, so, Unfortunately, we don't have um, a demo screen that we can do that on, but my point is this. Asian people, we are so much into community and the moments we build with our community. So with a technology like this, and mind you, if you want to talk about privacy and security, you can only do that with people in your um, address book, and you can also choose to have or not have that feature. So that is settled. But the point is, that if we really want to create communication for Asian people, we have to consider that we no longer go online. We actually live online. So in order for you to be effective in your communication and your messages, you have to consider the fact that we're always online and we are always on the go in the moment. Even if you're in silence, moments matter to you. Your culture, your language, your religion, everything that makes up who you are is actually in your hands to put online. So once again, I'll take care of the adaptable technology channel because that's our business. But for the rest, content, language, and experience, we need your help to make it work for us so that we can be the resurgent Asia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Via Gail Tan. The oohs and ahs from the delegates and participants indeed prove that that's quite a revelation on the findings and statistics on the use of smartphones, access to internet, connection speed, transformation of mobile connection. Change indeed has come to the world and in the field of communication. All right. We are indeed, we have to manage our time. We are supposed to be in the parallel sessions already. 
And thus, in the interest of time, please claim your snacks at the Marion Auditorium side veranda and proceed to the parallel sessions immediately. Do refer to your souvenir programs for the venues. Thank you very much and enjoy the parallel sessions. We will see each other again here at 4 o'clock for the third plenary session. Thank you very much. To those with meal stubs, please claim your snacks at the veranda, which is on the right exit, which is in the right exit from facing the stage. Thank you. Please proceed immediately to your preferred parallel sessions. 